In soccer, there's a lot of cutting, dynamic movement. So their body may be going this way, they're, the ball's going this way, they're trying to cut or juke or do a step over, push the ball the outside. Maybe it's even defending their knees at that vulnerable position. The ACL gets strained, 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 and then they cut and their knee falls in and you hear a pop, then they just fall right down. That's it. Welcome back everyone to the FC Game Changer Show. And today, Sean is here with us. Sean is a physical therapist and he's the owner of Tensegrity Physical Therapy located here in Eugene, Oregon. Sean sees several patients on a daily basis and most of these patients, they are soccer players. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks Armando for having me. I'm looking forward to uh talking about soccer players, some injury prevention ideas or reduction ideas, and seeing what we can uh, help, your, help your listeners learn. Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm excited because, you know, soccer players, you know, especially the younger soccer players, they sometimes don't do, or they don't know what to do, things to prevent injuries, or sometimes they get hurt, they don't know what to do. Sometimes it's a little thing that they may be thinking that it is a big injury, but sometimes it isn't. So it's good to have you here to break everything down in terms of physical therapy, injury prevention, even if they are injured, ways for them to come back even faster to, to the pitch. Sports specialization is some, a really hot topic out in the research right now. So yeah, it's definitely overwhelming. And throughout this next hour or so, hopefully we can talk about some specific injuries, some ideas, or just general concepts where uh, they can learn. Mm -hmm. So since I mentioned Tensegrity is located in Eugene, Oregon, so I want to make sure that this is for the Eugene community, but also if people are watching from no matter where they are, they're going to be able to take something out of this conversation. But explain uh, to us what makes Tensegrity different from a traditional physical therapy uh, clinic. Yeah, so Tensegrity is a physical therapy clinic that I wish I knew about when I was in my prime. You know, as soon as you walk in the door, you notice that there's a huge space and it's just different than any other place that you've probably been to. Diagnostic tools that less than 5% of physical therapy clinics in the entire country probably have. It allows us to do very, very specific data evaluation and really be able to determine what may or may not be going on with with someone and lastly I would say our philosophy is very different than most physical therapy places so the original owner or founder here seven years ago when I was doing my first interview asked me what I thought about the human body and I told him you know the human body is an aging machine that we can try to manipulate and he said yeah, that's one philosophy or thing to think about. And then he goes, asked if I think I can create parameters. And I said, you know, I, at the time I was a younger clinician and I felt pretty confident in my skills. Little did I know I still and forever will have things I need to, to keep learning. Um, so what he told me is that we see the body as a non-linear dynamic organism. So it's very difficult to determine and that's why every single person that comes in here needs to be seen through this model or lens because everybody is an individual to themselves. So that's where the name Tensegrity kind of comes out of or comes from. It's a term that's been around for a while, mostly in engineering, but it's in the way that we think about it through the body, it's, it's through tension and compression that keeps our body up against gravity. So we have bones, our structure that is there, and then we have our tendons, ligaments, connective tissue, fascia surrounding it, creating this dynamic relationship from a structural level all the way to a cellular level. So everything, whether we understand it or not, is connected to itself. This is why when people come in, we, we have to think about not just the body part. Let's say Armando came in for an injury and his knee hurts. A lot of times what can happen is we get really focused on that one area 
But what we need to do is we need to step back and we need to think, why would that area break down? It's different to every individual, whether their age, their genetics, their makeup, the different amount of sports they're playing, are they playing the same thing, how's their movement quality. So you've got to step back and kind of get an idea to determine what may be the actual cause or what is leading to this that the body, this nonlinear organism, dynamic organism is, is resulting in these pain responses that your brain's feeling. Mm -hmm. So I would say in a nutshell, the stuff that we have here, the diagnostic equipment, the philosophy, the multidisciplinary approach, that's what separates us. It's interesting because I've been here, right? I, I tore my ACL, came to Eugene to play for Lane United, and um, as soon as I got here, even though I was coming back from an ACL injury, uh, everyone from the staffing from Lane United, Dave, John Gallus, they were like, you need to go to this place. And I was curious to see what, what was different from the school that I was going to. And as soon as I stepped in here, like you said, the equipment that you guys have here, it's pretty much what, let's say, Real Madrid would have in terms of the biodex, right? You see professional teams, top tier teams, having the same equipment that you guys have here that I don't know if a lot of people especially in the Eugene, even the Oregon State area here, if they know, if they are aware that you guys have, you know, the gait analysis, running analysis, you have the EMG that tests the muscle activation. So coming to Eugene and, and being able to treat, get treatment from here, it was, it was great for me just to, you know, be involved with people that actually know what they're talking about. and and. And unfortunately, I did tear my ACL again, but people from here even tearing for the second time, they were like, let's start from the beginning from, with us that we're gonna get you back on the pitch as quick as possible so you're ready to go back to school and play and continue to play and things like that. And since the second injury that I had, it's been great. I still play and everything feels great. And knee is not the same anymore. It's been two, two ACL surgeries. So. But that doesn't stop me from, from playing. Well, that's an interesting point that you bring up that you tore it again, mm -hmm. even going through all this, this uh, high-level rehabilitation. One interesting thing that can be pulled out of the evidence in, in uh, ACL post-op care is, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other professionals, people get released on a time-based pra like practice. I think that was it. That's significantly too early for most people. So, they gave me six months. Yeah, six months. The graft is mostly, well, I can say for pretty much certain, is not fully integrated into your body at this point. So after you tear your ACL for the first time, you're three to five times more likely to tear it a second time, which is why our approach here is not a time-based approach. It is a movement-based approach. Mm -hmm with using these diagnostic tools. So one of the huge ones that gets used that most clinics don't have is our isokinetic biodex testing machine where it can test your quad index. So how strong your quad torque is or how strong, how much force you can output relative to your body weight percentage. And then you can compare it to what standard norm is and also compare it to your opposite side. Because again, everyone is an individual, so what's equal strength for me might not be the same as you. And ideally, we need to get that to within 10% of the opposite side. That's just one of our baseline things that we re require before we do or, or allow people to return. Mm -hmm. We also have the six movement screens with uh, force plate and cameras that shows how you are actually moving at a high speed to mimic what's happening when you're out playing. It's very, very difficult, almost near impossible to mimic movements in a facility like out when you're actually playing. And just like practice is gonna be very different than when you get to a full game mode. Once you're in that full game mode, you're not thinking, hey, I need to plant and then let my hips drop and, and move backwards. So we need to make that so it's, it's 
unconscious thoughts. As soon as you, you do thousands and thousands of reps, you change the neuromuscular system or firing output to your muscles so that you don't have to think about it when you go and cut and move and do that. You also build up more strength than what you had before so that you can have this capacity to allow your body to do this stuff. Because let's face it, in a soccer match, it's 100 miles an hour. You're not thinking, you're not moving. You can't control the variables. Within yourself, you can't even control the variables. Yet, bet alone, or yet alone, someone putting a shoulder into you, jumping in the air, going for a header, battling, getting stuck into a tackle. There's just factors that you can't control, but what you can control is the appropriate time of when you return. And that's where I think, again, the tensegrity separates ourselves from a lot of other places because we have the tools and the knowledge of and understanding these kids need to take the time because what's going to happen is as soon as you let them go, they're going to come back and be torn. And let's face it, once you have one done, then the, the next time it happens, it's even more difficult to get back to where you want to go. So truly, you're looking at a solid year to two years before there's true maturation of this graft that happens. It doesn't mean you have to sit out for two years, but you need to be training this entire time. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned because that's exactly what happened, right? So I got the surgery at school, initiated the treatment at school. So when I came here, it had been six months already. So I was cleared by the doctor, right? When I got here, did all the testing that you guys do, they told me exactly what you just explained. Your force output that we tested on the biodex, my muscles were strong. So they were like, okay, now we're gonna test the movement side of things that you said, force plate, cameras, the six movements. On those, after I did all of them, they said, hey, you shouldn't go back fully because of this and that and that, because they assessed my movement patterns. It wasn't quite good to go back. In my mind, I was young, couldn't wait to play. And I think that's good for us to talk about this because a lot of kids, they get hurt, but they can't wait to go back and play again because they think, oh no, I'm a superhero, nothing's gonna happen. If the doctor told me that I can't go back in six months, it doesn't matter what I did on the, within those six months, I can't go back, right? So I left here and said, yeah, my muscles are strong enough. My movement pattern isn't quite good, but I'm just gonna go back and see what happens. Tore again. again. And it's exactly what you said. The second time, one, your mental is completely destroyed because you already battled that first injury. And now you have the second one. You know that you're gonna have to do everything over and again and to keep, get strong again, improve your movement patterns. And that was actually when I initiated, got the surgery in Eugene, initiated the treatment with you guys, and I knew exactly what I needed to do going back to school. Took about a year and a few months. That's when I got back, and it hasn't bothered me or, you know, my knees. Again, it's not the same, but it doesn't stop me from doing anything. There are no athletes that want to hear the words, stop, you're not ready. Yeah. It's not in an athlete's mentality to not try to compete, yep. whether it's for you know, higher levels, whether it's how you fun, have fun, as you get older, it's your stress relief. No one wants to be told they can't do it. So it's part of our jobs to be that person, to you know, not control the life, but to give each individual the most amount of knowledge and information and try to relate to them and say like, hey, this is where we're at. This doesn't mean you can't play. But let's think about these different, different aspects of the healing process where maybe I wouldn't go into a game right now. Maybe, maybe just work on training, just work on your ball work, your technique, get into small-sided games if you can control yourself that way. Again, each individual is going to require a different set of circumstances. So being able to tailor that to them is what makes physical therapy, in my opinion, and one of the main reasons why I wanted to go the physical therapy route instead of the medical doctor route, is you truly get to make relationships with these patients that you see for an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, 
or 45 minutes one-on-one -on -one, multiple times a week, a month for you know, a year. You become their person to ask questions, to know how they move. Our job is to be, and what PTs are, is we are movement and analysis experts. Sur orthopedic surgeons are experts at surgery. So to them, when they look at something on an image, they feel, their, feel your, the Lachman's test, they feel your knee, they say, yeah, this thing is in there solid, pat themselves on the back, I did a great job, this surgery is amazing, you're good to go. But there's a lot more. There's much, much more to that than, than just the time frame. So, yeah, do you know what the most common, the number one sport in the world is for ACL injuries? Is it soccer? Yeah, it's soccer. It is? It is, it is. yeah. And is there a difference between male and female? Females can tear their ACLs up to five times more, more. common than males. It do, it's again, it's a very common male injury as well, but females, it's even more common. I would bet that if we go around every high school team, travel team from the ages of 12 to 16, I would bet at least one person has been dealing with it. Do we have research that will, you know, explain the reason that female, you know, athletes, they have a higher percentage than Yeah, so than there's male? a couple different uh, philosophies or ideas through research as to why. And again, we are organisms that are very difficult to research, so we can have our best guesses. There's mechanical factors, there's hormonal factors, there's strength factors. But another very big one actually is if we took Chris Powers down at USC, took 500 female soccer athletes and had them do a drop down test. So they stand on a 12 inch box, they jump down and they land. And he just recorded them, had sensors on them, recorded them, cameras in the front and the side view. And what you see is they'll, they'll land and they'll be very quad dominant. And what I mean by quad dominant is they'll land, their shock absorption comes through their quads, and their knees will travel forwards and, and in. Yeah. So then when you compare that to males, more commonly than not, what will happen is males will drop their butts down and use their glutes. Interesting. And you know what the most, the, the most powerful muscle in the body is? Your, well, your glutes. glutes yeah. So if we're asking these, these quad muscles which cross the knee and one of them crosses the hip as well but and you don't tend to use your glutes as well you put a bunch of stress to the knee and what happens during most ACL injuries are non-contact meaning meaning you're not going in there's not a tackle or traumatic incident which yes there can be that as well that's part of it but about 70 percent of them are non-contact so the ACL is meant to keep the tibia from translating to forwards on, on the femur, the bone above. And the tibia, just for people that are listening, watching, where, where is that, that The bone? tibia is the, you're like your main shin bone. So what the most common thing that's happened is you're asking your quad to work a ton. Females, again, tend to overuse their quads. So then they're going to plant. They plant down, their knees going from a flex position to an extended position. They're trying to load their whole body weight. As soon as the knee, knee gets to about the most common or percentage uh, or knee flex at 23 to 28 degrees is when the, the ACL is gonna be stressed the most. And at that same time, in soccer, there's a lot of cutting, dynamic movement. So their body may be going this way, they're, the ball's going this way, they're trying to cut or juke or do a step over, push the ball to the outside. Maybe it's even defending. Their knees at that vulnerable position, the ACL gets strained, 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 and then they cut and their knee falls in and you hear a pop, then they just fall right down. That's, that is the most common. It's a deceleration, so the muscle's working the hardest possible. It's a deceleration, rotation, change of direction mm. is when it mostly mm. happens. Since we're talking about the, the ACL uh, injuries and, and you mentioned you know, any high schools and teams, club teams, if we go around and ask, a lot of them will be dealing with that injury. 
what I know that it is complicated to tell someone to do something because we don't know them, right? But what can we tell them in terms of prevention of that injury? Because it's a horrible injury, we know that. And uh, even for those that are currently injured right now with an ACL, just got the surgery, what could they be doing to speed up the process or prevent that injury from happening? Yeah, that's a good question. So. My advice, again, would is everybody is an individual and needs an, uh, a treatment or an evaluation based on what their body is looking like at that time, where there's restrictions, where there's weaknesses, deficits, asymmetries. But as a whole, I would say strength training. You know, there's been a movement in the last 10 years, especially throughout the Premier League, where strengthening is very vital to uh, injury prevention. And, and in reality, I don't like the term injury prevention. I think it should be, be called or coined more as a injury reduction or risk reduction because you can't prevent. Prevent, prevent is very difficult yeah. to, and it's a bold statement, but it sounds good and you know, right. if someone told me, hey, on social media, this is the one exercise you can do to prevent right. this, oh, I'd be hammering that one exercise. But then I, then I flip to the next, the next page. It's, and it's something else. It's a different exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, again, in this social media world, it's very difficult to know what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to know this guy looks really strong and, that's, and what he says, I'm gonna go with. But this person says something different. So again, some philosophies of thought, and, and in my opinion is, Things sell, and that's what people want to do. It, it's, they have bold statements, and they make claims. And at the end of the day, what we need to do is look at each individual and say, hey, how can we address this? But really, it's full body movements and strengthening. You know, Once we get to a certain level of strengthening or, or building up the capacity, is a term that I, that I use often in the clinic, is build up the capacity to do the movement that that you ask your body to do. And that's very different from a youth athlete to, to uh, an aging athlete as well. So very different problems, but same foundational movements. Every, every workout you do or regime or program that you have should have a press, a pull, something for your trunk or abdominal region. You know, people use the term core. I don't believe because of the tensegrity model that anything in your entire body works in isolation. So, I believe that too. yeah, a squat and then, and then a hinge. Those are the five principles that we typically will utilize for development. So females, going back to the ACL, uh, why would they fall in? Why would they collapse in and have increased mechanical load to their ACL or the medial aspect of their knee is they tend to just be weaker through their hip complex, their glute med, the lateral or the outside muscles that help control the pelvis and keep it stable with when you're on one leg, those tend to be weaker. So doing, do, relearning hip hinge movements is a, is a good place to start. But get into a good program, find a team within your community. It doesn't have to be Tensegrity, but it can be anywhere in your community, whether you're in Eugene, away from Eugene, find, a, find someone who you can trust that is, that's knowledgeable in movement patterns, get an assessment, uh, find someone who can help you learn how to move properly and strength train. There was a uh, kind of a fading thought or idea that used to be when you know, when I was growing up and a little bit before, it's don't start lifting weights too young because yes. it's going to stunt your growth. In reality, I mean, there's a smart way to do things and a, a way that it can compromise things, but they've proven that through the research that that's not the case. Where what needs to happen is early on, you know, let's say 10, 11, 12, is we need to, as they move, as these children move away from playing five different sports, playing out in the playgrounds, ha always having at least an hour of play a day, moving away from that, we need to get them into a mindset of, of treating their neuromuscular system and teaching them proper ways to move first. 
And then as they really learn that, that might take a year, it might take two years. That you learn that, go through the motions, and then you can start adding weight as they, as they start to mature. Females mature earlier than, than males do on the, on the average, but get the movement down, and that will help build a foundation all the way through. That's where I wish I had more of that. It used to just be, oh, I gotta be strong, I need to go to the gym, get on a Smith squat machine, get on the leg press, yeah. do some Russian twists, all now that I just wouldn't, I wouldn't give that to athletic, soccer players looking to, for movements. I would focus on the five principles we talked about, get, in, get them really, really strong and, and confident in their movements, which is very difficult because growth spurts happen. Mm -hmm. You get that awkward movement. You, at first, for a little while, you were, let's say you were the kid who grew really fast. You were really good, you grew really fast, and then you didn't have to worry about your skills. You, you were faster than other people, so you got away with these mistakes. Whereas when I was a younger, or a later bloomer, I was small, I had to focus on these skills. I had to focus on movement. I had to focus on my, like, getting myself in position on the soccer fields so that I could, you know, still get to the ball if I wasn't faster. So that's where, you know, everyone's just different and you have to you know, work through your individualness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys know, uh, Sean is also a, a soccer player. He's a former slash current soccer player. Uh, we played together and we were talking about things that you did before that you wish you didn't that you would never you know, tell a soccer player or someone, an athlete, to do the things that you did before. Uh, but then I listen, you know, a bunch of young players saying, I don't have time to strength train, I don't have the right equipment, or I'm gonna get too big, I'm, it's gonna slow me down, and I don't know what to do. What do you tell them in terms of frequency? You mentioned already a pull, a press, a carry, hinge, squat, and all of those things I assume also do single leg and single arm. Uh, uh, what's the frequency that would help them in terms of consistency? So yeah, that's, that's a, good, a good point. It's difficult when you have school. When you play like, for example, when I was younger, I'd play on two, three different teams at, at the same time. I, really the issue with the youth sports right now, the injuries that I see is overuse. There's, it's too it's much, too much, too much overuse. They, the kid comes, goes from school, comes to PT, leaves PT, goes to, goes to soccer practice. Right from soccer practice, has track practice. After track practice, gets home, has to do all of his homework, eat, goes to bed. Re and do it repeat. again. It's just, you know, the way that American soccer is, or travel, the pay-to-pay -pay model mm -hmm. is. They're doing, a, there's, there's clubs that do a better job of this, but it's frequency, you know, it's a business as well. The overall purpose is designed to, for the individual or for the player to get better and have fun and have a community, but at the end of the day, it's a business. No other countries have these pay to play models like we do here. Mm -hmm. So overuse injuries is, I would say, is the key thing. But it, it again, it's very different to ask what, what's the repetitions, the frequency. It depends the age, the time, you know, you yeah. know the time of the year they're in. Are they in the middle of the season or at the be beginning of the season? So I would say your heavy strength training should come after, of, uh, after season or out of season. That's when you can really go hard. focus and go hard. Mm -hmm. And then as Pretty you get- make the gains on off season so then you can maintain them. Yes. So okay. do try to, you know, gain weight, eat bet, like eat more, get, get your strength and fitness up, your heavier lifting where you're really trying to get muscle mass. Everybody is pretty much programmed for a certain amount of, of mass. And I just would not be worried, especially if you're younger, of getting too big. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to slow you down like yeah. some people may think. Yeah, it, it is. If anything, it's just going to help you. There's, a, there's an end of a spectrum on either side right. with everything. So just try to find that middle balance. So I would say you can get benefits if you're working out three times a week. And 
that's for the youth athletes. For very different advice that I have for athletes, you know, once they start to get their 30s, 40s, 50s, is those are not typically overuse. Those are your weekend warrior mostly, yeah. you know. You're gonna find you work 40, 50 hours during the week, you're, you're with your family, you're, your life is so busy Monday through Friday, then Saturday comes and you're so you excited go. to go play. <laughs> And yeah. you remember 10 years ago, I could do this and this and this. And you go try to do it. And what happens is, as we age, we, we lose water density in our body through everything. And, and our fascia, our connective tissue, these irregularly shaped collagen fibers that, are, that allow us to create viscoelasticity within our body that gets things moving, they start to stiffen up. And what happens is we just can't stretch as much as we, as we could before. And if we're not actively working on this, then the most common thing I see is tears. And this is what changed for me. I, I grew up playing all the time. Never had to worry about working out. I wish I knew more. It would have made me a better soccer player. It would have made me faster. It would have would have helped me maybe miss some of these injuries, little things that happened to me. Then afterwards, I, my college career ended. I, I'm still fit. I still, I'm low 20s. I still have a high metabolism. I still feel good. Then I just start playing. I play three, four times a week. I'm staying in shape. All of the work that I put in through college and you know my late teens, building up bone density, muscle mass, that's still carrying me through. Then things start to get busier in my life. I'm further away from the things that I did. I'm 27 years old. I'm playing in a, with you, actually, in a Latina league in Springfield. And I go to take, a, take a, a full sprint. And I go take one step. My leg goes behind me. And I hear a pop. And I'm like, I know immediately, there goes my hamstring. I've never torn anything in my life until now. Yeah, I've, ro I've, had, I've rolled my ankles. I've broken bones. But there goes my hamstring. I'm 27, and I'm thinking, hey, this is just a small little blip in the radar. So then I go back, I keep going. I, I take three months off, maybe. And then, like a lot of hamstring injuries, I get back. I, I'm, I'm playing a little bit of scrimmaging. Then I go to play a game. Again. Do it again. This is telling me, all right, I'm aging. Things are changing for me. <laughs> yeah. So then I change my mindset. I, I really, I dive into the research. Why is this happening? What's going on? I find out that I think that I'm still really strong. When we just go for runs, we're working on cardiovascular strength. It's, it doesn't tax our muscles that much. It does, but not that much to do that, to go for a, a three, four mile run, you know? So it's really our fascial system that creates this movement that in the late, late 90s, or early 90s, I think, Serge Grakiewicz, he did some work on fascia and helped determine that it's the fascial system that does most of our movement and our strength. Yeah. So we used to think it's just muscle. Let's get stronger and stronger. It's the muscles that allow this to, to, to lift heavy things. In reality, muscles, they did some, some research. Muscles can only do about 50, kilograms of motion or of movement then then we have in, then they got into the intra-abdominal pressure well when you're lifting something brace your belly really hard that adds another maybe 10 to 15 kilograms but how are these people able to lift 600 Massive 700 amounts. 800 pounds if Thor, can only do he that. did over a thousand pounds that right there is your neuromuscular system and your fascial system working together mm -hmm. some people have more more capability to send signals and create bigger movements and this fascial system allows things to to get tight and move so after i'm 28 i've had two pretty bad injuries in my hamstring i realize things are changing and i need to start training differently so then i started dedicating or thinking okay if my end goal is to play soccer that is what i love that is my that is what's given me everything that it has in my life and I want to play if my goal it depends on what your goal is mm -hmm. my goal is to play with my boys when they're older exactly. I want to play as long as I possibly can so I need to start 
training for that. Yeah. You're not going to be able to continue to play without doing anything. Just like, okay, weekends, I'm just going to go out and play. If you do that, maybe injuries will continue to, to keep happening. I will, I will certainly say injuries will continue to happen if we just, or if you, the athlete, doesn't start training for what their goal is. So what we need to do, or what you need to do, is build the capacity of your body to handle, to handle what you're asking it to do. So if you wanna just, you know, if your end goal is just to be able to go for five mile walks with your, with your dog, your wife, you don't have to train the same way as if you wanna to go to Saturday pick up and play with your friends that you've been doing for 20 years. You have to train in that capacity. And it's not just strength, it's agility and movement. And it doesn't have to be five days a week, an hour and a half every day. You don't need to be training like a college kid, but you need to start training a little bit in a way where you're asking your body to to remember and learn and build the capacity to how to do these things that you're asking it to do on a fun pickup mm -hmm, day. Mm -hmm. Because soccer is taxing, right, to the body. It's a, it's a hard thing to the body. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, it, it's very interesting that you're saying that because not so much for the young athletes, but more for, you know, let's say over 35 even. You know, most of these, these players, they are not doing, you know, maintenance strengthening. They're not working on movement patterns. They're pretty much just going, you know, out and playing soccer. And no wonder why, you know, you see a bunch of them here in the clinic. Yeah, our clinic has a lot of them. You know, there, there is never one specific way, this is the best way to train. There's evidence that shows any training for soccer players, specifically any resistance training actually improves you know let's say my knee is what there's evidence that shows I come in and I have a, a knee pain and all I do is bench press I bench press and I tax my system you're gonna it's gonna get you better I'm not hundred percent sure why but my best guess is that you're training your neuromuscular system for big force output and yeah, movement recruitment, yeah. and recruitment it's also giving you confidence it's giving you confidence of strength, which is key for movement. Right, right. So when, the other thing, Armando, when you mentioned 30s. The 30s. We've, we've talked right. earlier about ACLs being a, you know, it's a very common injury. Let's talk about the Achilles tendon and ACLs being more common in females. The Achilles tendon ruptures, tears. Are is, they more common in male yeah, athletes? They're more common in male athletes. In the third and fourth decade, in male athletes is when predominantly you'll see those. And why is that? Is that? Again, a lot of the things that we just talked about, we, we lose viscoelasticity, so our, our tendon, our Achilles, our muscle of our calves, we have three of them that come down and they tie into this, this Achilles tendon, which goes to the bottom of your foot, things just stiffen up. They don't move as much as they did before. And if you're not asking your body to train in these ways with some explosive movements, you increase your risk of injury. Wow. There's been just as common as ACLs are at younger teens. I've seen just playing in the last three years, actually there, three different times where the, the Achilles tendon ruptures. And, and again, it's not from contact. Usually someone plants, they go to take off, their foot's in a fully dorsiflexed position, which is stretching out the, Ach the Achilles tendon as much as possible, and they go to accelerate and push off, and you just hear a, again, pop. And these people that it happens to, all three times, look around. They say, what happened? No one's near me. Mm, interesting. They, it feels like someone took a bat and just hit you right there. And this is a, there's some research that shows you can heal this without surgery, but most of the time it's gonna be surgery and it's gonna take, it's gonna take another year of post-op care. So why not put your body and mind in the best position to avoid these injuries so you don't have to deal with these? Because there's a way, right? That's exactly what you're, what you're explaining. Yeah, there's, there's a way to do things to mitigate risk, just like everything. So go, going back to the injuries that you said that you've had uh, from playing, 
uh, and, and also your soccer career, how has that uh, impacted the way that you, you treat not just athletes and soccer players, but your treatment method, how, how has that impacted you? So when I was younger, I spent a lot of time playing soccer on multiple teams. And I would probably categorize myself now as in an overuse. I did too much. Although I too loved, much of soccer too, too or much too of much soccer, of many, many. Too, uh, I would play on multiple teams, multiple, like in the same season, take very little time off because I just loved it. And all I wanted to do was play and be competitive and get to the next level and see and and just push myself. That's what what I did when I was younger. I turned 17, started talking to colleges, started feeling really good. I started developing, started some strength training. Things started going really good and I broke my leg from a tackle. Then I'm just, I'm bummed. Then I, then I go to the doctor, I put in a cast, I'm in a cast for six, eight weeks. I come out, I get my first introduction of physical therapy. And I'm, I, this is, where I wish I came to a place like Tensegrity. At this location, it was good. It was a small area. They mainly just focused on balance, making sure I could do a little bit of jumping. Most of it was on just pain because I'm a 17-year-old athlete, male, strong. And I think at this point, I think to myself, I'm, I, nothing can hurt me. This is very small. Mm -hmm. Then I. They, I tell them I feel fine, I'm ready to go. I go back, I start training, I play. I haven't asked my body to, to do the things that I'm asking it to do. I just go back to soccer. What happens to me? I go back after about, let's say three months, I break my right leg, my tibia. Just both, the, that shin bone, both the bones there. I break that one. Again, I think, oh, freak accident. I drink my milk, what's going on? The doctors just say, oh, you're just unlucky. No, no that's not unlucky. That's ill-prepared. I should not have gone back so early. I didn't ask my body to do things. There's something called Wolf's Law that some people may be familiar with regarding bones specifically is as we input into our system or into our body, our, we're, our species, our body is so intelligent, it's going to it's going to feel that and adapt. So what happens is it lays down new bone collagen and synthesis. So it builds the bone up more. But let's say I take three months off and I'm just doing very simple balance exercises once or twice a week, then I'm just hanging out. I get time now to hang out with my friends, maybe play a little video games, even though I was never good at them. My, my system has not been asked to do what I did before then I, my skill's still there because I worked on it. So I go back to, back to the hoping to play at that same level, the same skill, I get in, I play a game, happens again. It, I'm told I'm unlucky. Then I go back to the same physical therapist, same, same thing. Go through that, three months, I think I have had my left one done, my right one done, I'm told I'm strong again. Three months later, I probably should have taken a sign as Let's, let's see how this goes, go a little bit slower. I go back in again. I'm, I'm starting to freak out. I'm thinking, I've had two broken legs. I'm, I'm in my senior year of high school. How am I gonna play in the future? Am I gonna lose this game that I, that I love? So I go back early to go to a college showcase. In that college showcase, someone slides right over my foot. I fall forwards and I twist, my foot stays. And what happens there is a torque to my, to my tibia and my fibula, and it's gonna break at its weakest point as everything does, right where my fracture was before. Left or right? My, my left one. So now, three broken legs in nine months. This one requires surgery, terrible. I think I, I'm, I'm lost, I don't know what to do, and then, and then I just, with the help of my family and my friends, I just grind again. And I really, I take my time to go back. This, luckily, again, I think in, everything happens for a reason. For a reason, I believe that so too. So I end up thinking, what do I like to do? 
Hey, I love soccer and I love helping people and talking to people, building relationships. What can I do that in? Physical therapy. Oh, that's how he came about. So that's, that's where, you know, after discussing with my mom and my dad and some friends, I start shadowing. And I'm like, man, this is what I want to do, 100%. That's cool. But I want to play soccer. So then I start narrowing my search. And a coach that contacted me earlier, still interested in me, even though I've had three broken legs in the year before I'm going there. So I, so I find a, a physical therapy school that I can play at that's competitive and good. And I, I match them together and it, it was perfect. Crazy. I wouldn't change anything. Just like, I don't know if you've experienced this, but soccer is more than just a competitive game. Way it's, more than It's that. given me everything that I've had to this day. So it gets me into a school that I would never have changed. It gets me into a profession that I never would have wanted to do. My first job was because of one of the alumni of, of my program helped me. I, I loved working there. Then. My, I, I meet my wife, who is my roommate in, from soccer, that connection there. Then we decide to take a leap of faith. We move out west, not knowing what we're going to do. As we're out here, I take a travel job with, with Peace Health, a position that's not the ideal clinic that I'm at. So what do I do when I move out here? We don't know anyone. I go to a soccer field and start playing. Someone asks me, hey, what do you think about playing on my team? I go, I play on this team, I meet you, and I meet John Gallus. Yeah. And meanwhile, at this clinic that I'm at, they're asking me to work full time, and I'm telling them, I don't think that this is right for me. And then the boss there says, there's one place in town that you need to go. It's Tensegrity Physical Therapy. So I send a resume in, three months, don't hear anything, start playing soccer, meet you two, who happen to have a connection here through with Tensegrity. Then I get linked up with Tensegrity, which has been made, like, been the, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Yeah, it's way more than just a game. It's way more. If I go off on everything that it's the same, it's I'm only here speaking with you right now because of the game. It's, it's you know, leaving my country, coming here, going to school and meeting people. It's, it's amazing. It's also a good point as well to make to, you know, let's say kids that they, they're too focused on, on I know that you need to be competitive. I know that you want to become a soccer player, but just so you know, there's a lot more within this game that, yeah. My, my best friends are around the world because of soccer. Exactly. So the community is the just... The community is there. An interesting fact that I heard when I was taking one of my coaching level courses, my licensed coaches, by the age that, pu that children go into high school, 80% 65 to 80 percent of kids that played soccer stopped playing soccer. That's 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 huge. It's a lot. It's, yeah. It, things stop being fun for them. It becomes too competitive. You know, soccer is is a way that you can meet other people. There's a way that you. It's a it's a way that when I go to a different country, I can speak to someone without speaking to someone. Exactly. You know. Exactly. So. I just hate to see that get taken away because of too much competition. Exactly. Co being competitive and learning teamwork and, and understanding how to win and understanding how to lose, I think is extremely important, but that doesn't need to be what it's all about. Yeah, so there's a lot more. Now I feel like I'm in a position where I can help people of any skill, any age, any level play for as long as they want to play. So, and I think one of the best ways that I can do that is by teaching proper body movements, giving them ideas of training and load management to help them achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Right. Right. The information here is, again, not just for, you know, young soccer players or older soccer players, it's for, you know, soccer players around the world. And, uh, I just want to make sure that if you're injured right now, don't think that that's going to be the end of your career, just like you thought. And I also did think that way when even the first one happened. There are ways and maybe even ways for you to come back even stronger than you were before, more aware of things than, than, than before. 
and everything that we're talking about here is, is, is an eye-opening for, you know, even for myself, right? I've had two ACL surgeries and you've had the three broken uh, uh, legs and what can you tell them that you know, don't, don't be scared? I know that it might be difficult right now. How can you work that mindset on the Yeah, the mind, mindset is huge. Mindset is, is more important than physical aspects, I would say, than the, your physical strength is your mindset. I, that happened to me because like, even knowing that I could go back and play, because I was strong, my, my ACL was good to go, I was cleared. Going back and playing up here, it wasn't quite right. I was afraid. I wouldn't go as hard as I could. What can we tell them? I would say the human body is, is amazing and it is meant to heal and be pushed. And you see this through many different sports than just soccer, these extreme sports. The human body is designed to be put to the test and we are a healing agent within itself. So as long as you give it a proper mindset, the right input or nutrition mm -hmm. and strength training and and agility training and proper warm up it is designed to move mm -hmm. we are not meant to sit in a chair all day mm -hmm. and work and play video games we are meant to be on our two feet moving reaching jumping surviving right and thriving right right and again Maybe some of the, you know, the players there are like thinking that they're not going to be able to go back. He hasn't even been like a ACL. He hasn't even been like a broken leg. It's an ankle sprain or something like that that might be, you know, affecting them mentally and making them afraid of going back. So I think having you and I here, two ACL, three, you know, broken uh, injuries, I think that's kind of like a, hey, you're good, you know, just do the right things to get back that you're gonna be fine. This kind of comes back to the beginning of our conversation is surround yourself with, with people that are there to, to lift you up. That, that can't be said enough, whether it's your friends, your family, your teammates, your medical team. I would say that if you don't like an answer from a doctor or a physical therapist, go to another one. Right. Go to a different one, find what, someone that is going to be there to help you because don't stop. You have to just keep pushing and moving and you get stuck in a mindset where things are very acute. But when you really step back from a situation and you can see it, it gets much easier. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, yes, yeah, surround yourself with the right people. It's good for them to hear that. Um, it's getting to an end, like I mentioned. We always ask this question to every single guest, and it is uh, related to our program, our project. Tell us a game changer moment in your life and why. I'm gonna answer that with not just one moment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a game changing philosophy is always being open to new opportunities and being willing to match that with intensity and dedication. So whether that's for me from my early soccer career, my transitioning in my physical therapy career, transitioning to, to marrying my wife, having three kids, and buying a practice and running a practice. I'm gonna just say things are not always easy and I'm gonna take my own advice and have to step back sometimes, but the end result will always be there if you're willing to put the, the effort into it. So I would say trying to live a game changing, game changer life is, is, my, is my moment. That's cool. That's cool. Because, yeah, that, that's a broad uh, question as well. And also, Sean, where for the Eugene community and even, you know, Oregon people or even, let's say, overseas that people are watching this and they want to come to Tensegrity, they've done everything that they could, but they, they haven't found a physical therapy place just like Tensegrity. Where can people find you, find Tensegrity Physical Therapy online? Where yeah, can they You can find, find us. We have a... a beautiful website, tensegrityphysicaltherapy.com. We're on Instagram and Facebook. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
and I hope to catch you soon. FC Game Changer, the football club that will change your game.